Hello. I want us to go back 35 years. I'm going to take us back 35 years for a moment to the fall of the Berlin Wall. If I could get slides up, that would be great as well. There we go. So I'm going to take us back 35 years to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, whether you were 30 and you watched this happen on TV, or you were just born and you learned about it in the history books decades later, it stands as a very profound moment in time where a literal physical man-made barrier came crashing down and humanity got to prevail that day. It was a moment to reconnect, to see each other, to humanize each other, and to see each other for what we really are, not just the perceptions and the projections that we had of each other. And it was also a really powerful moment to think about where do we want society to go forward from there? So with the Berlin Wall coming down, the end of the Cold War, it marked a new era. And one of my favorite playwrights of all time, Václav Havel, who's also the first Czech prime minister uh, after the, the end of the Cold War, gave this phenomenal speech in front of the US Congress, basically saying that this was the moment in time to have an economic and political reboot, to completely rethink how we approach systems. But more importantly, that it was a reboot of consciousness. It was an opportunity to think about philosophically how did we want to go forward from there. So it's a profound moment, so much opportunity. And then we absolutely blew it. We had the perfect opportunity to start to change how we did things, but instead we deflected back to thinking about the world and us versus them. We defaulted back to our projections of people. We defaulted back to learning, to ignoring the lessons of history. And most of all, we defaulted to deflecting our social and political responsibilities and taking control and being responsible for the health of our societies and our democracies. This might resonate a bit, given the current context. But this is the big challenge, and that was a critical juncture point. And why I mention this 35 years on is that we're not at too dissimilar of a point, but we're at this point because of AI. We're at this inflection moment where we're about to inject AI into the nervous system of society. And this is the moment we need to pause, we need to reflect, and we need to think about where do we want society to go from here? And how do data and technology fundamentally power that vision? So now is our chance to ask that question. So for the last two years, I've been working with an incredible group of data scientists, behavioral scientists, creators, systems thinkers, strategists, to start to think about how do we use data and technology to drive a positive societal outcome? And we call that beneficial intelligence. So the whole idea of beneficial intelligence really flips the script on technological revolutions. Because what's the thing we always lose in technological revolutions? It's what it means to be human, right? It's our humanity. So what we are arguing is that data and technology can actually help make us more human because it gives us the insight that we need to understand the other, to understand people, to understand their culture, to understand their context, and to build a bridge, and a bridge that is steeped with empathy. All it requires is a motivation to do so. What beneficial intelligence does not do is demonize data and technology, because data doesn't lead, data doesn't decide how it's used. We humans decide how it's used. We decide what gets built. We decide how we apply it. And in that essence, AI is really a mirror of us and a reflection of the outcomes that we drive. AI is not a mirror of itself. AI is a mirror of us. And so with beneficial intelligence, what's perhaps most challenging and even in a sense most controversial is the intentionality because we have to want to build a bridge. We need to want to humanize the other as opposed to demonize them. We need to want to come to a resolution and we need to want to come to a place of peace. So for me, this is quite personal because uh, in addition to being a California native and a very proud one, I must add, I am also a descendant of several Asian ethnicities, many of whom, to be very honest, are not exactly the biggest fans of each other. So my entire childhood was spent trying to deconstruct these sorts of identity constructs and the sources of this discord. Whether it lay in religion or it lay in politics or in history, I was constantly trying to unpack that, because in a way it was almost like I was trying to reconcile myself to myself. But that's what beneficial intelligence helps us do, if we actually analyze data in that way. 
So it's quite powerful. And we need that now. And we need that now more than ever. Because as a global society, we have two major, major challenges we're facing. The first is an increased level of polarization and fragmentation that's causing an incredible level of social instability and volatility. I think perhaps we all feel this whenever we look at the news. And the second big issue that we need to combat is the fact that the way technology has been developed and the way it's been deployed are not fit for purpose for the challenges that we face. So let's deep dive into the first challenge. So if you think about that moment when the Berlin Wall fell, the end of the Cold War, there was a lot of optimism, it was a new world. Yeah, especially in an American and a European context, we got to skate on some really smooth ice for a while, where we got to assume that the rest of the world was really on the same page as us in terms of our political and economic and social values. We got to assume that our rights would always be rights. We got to assume that our economies would be stable. And then some cracks started to form on the ice, and then deeper ones, and then deeper ones. So you might be wondering, what are some of these sources of those cracks? 9-11 and the war on terror, Brexit, Trump, COVID, Ukraine, the repercussions of everything we're seeing in the Middle East right now, and that ice has gotten very, very craggy. And it's the shaking the status quo. I think we can all feel that. But the reality is that what I just described is fundamentally a Western context. Because if you look at the rest of the world, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, it's a different reality. They're very, very dynamic cultures, contexts. Climate has already hit those regions in a way that's been disproportionate to what we've experienced in Europe and the United States. But there's also an incredible level of creativity and wisdom in those regions. And therefore, the way that technology has been developed and deployed is also fundamentally different than the Western context. So if we as global solutionists are trying to figure out how do we combat the challenges ahead, whether it's perhaps some of the biggest geopolitical systems changes that we've experienced since World War II, all of the changes brought about by AI, as well as the impending doom and gloom of climate change, we have to challenge ourselves to think differently. We need to draw on wisdom and knowledge from every corner of the planet, and we need to challenge ourselves to have a level of vision, creativity, and ambition than perhaps we've never had to have. And now is the time, now more than ever, and especially for the technology community. Because if you look at the second major global challenge that I referenced, is that the technologies that we've deployed are not fit for purpose for addressing the challenges I've just described. And there's a few reasons for that. So if you take AGI, so artificial general intelligence, for example. So, and if you are following anything to do with open AI, you might be somewhat familiar with this. So the stated objective of AGI is for AI to outperform humans at economic and cognitive tasks. From a shareholder value perspective, sure, that makes sense. Fewer humans to employ, more algorithms, drive shareholder value, right? But if you think about this from a societal perspective and from a philosophical perspective, what are we actually driving at when that is the stated ambition? And so this underpins the challenge, the fact that there's not a strong philosophical backbone guiding the decisions we're making around technology, in addition to the fact that the pressures to commercialize as quickly as possible are so high. So that's one part of the problem. Then we've got the other part of the problem, which is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction and a lot of fear towards AI, data, and technology. I have to say, for not the worst reasons on the planet, but there is a knee-jerk reaction against it in a lot of instances. And so kind of the default has been, let's avoid using data and technology in contexts that are bad, and let's only use it for good. Which is all well and good if the world were black and white and if the world were actually good versus evil. It's like a 1980s Hollywood movie, right? Where there's very clearly a good guy, very clearly a bad guy, and usually it's Arnold Schwarzenegger coming in to beat up the bad guy, right? Sadly, that's not the world we live in. So if we think about the broader spectrum of use cases that we as technologists have to solve for, and sort of think about it as a standard distribution curve, you've got maybe 5% on one end of the spectrum that's quite clearly evil. You've got the other 5% that on the other end of the spectrum that clearly is for good. But then you've got the whole murky, messy middle, which is about 90% of the use cases. 
So what are we supposed to do? Not tackle those? It's messy, it's thorny in there, who knows how we approach it, but that's where all the beauty lies, and that's actually where all the opportunity lies, because if we can start to tackle that and deconstruct it and unpick some of those thorny knots, that's where we actually can drive a really powerful paradigm shift. But that's where we need the right frameworks, the right ways of thinking, and especially thinking about this from an impact lens to be able to unpick those. And that is, again, where beneficial intelligence is so, so powerful and is the ultimate tool. So I'm going to take you through its core tenets. The first, human centricity. So we have a saying within the beneficial intelligence space that every challenge is fundamentally a human challenge. Whether, let's say, you are a film executive trying to, trying to drive film ticket sales for an upcoming Marvel movie, or you're trying to reduce smoking, or you're trying to increase levels of recycling. Who's buying the tickets? Who's smoking? Who's recycling? It's people, fundamentally. It is people. So when we can put people at the center of the challenge that we're trying to solve, it completely changes how we think about it and enables a much stronger understanding that we ultimately can leverage into driving impact. The second is relevance. So if you ask the wrong question, that then lends itself to selecting the wrong data set, looking at the wrong variables, generating the wrong insights, and ultimately designing a strategy and implementing a strategy that can do more harm than good. And I'll give you an example of this from the platform safety space. So if you think about Facebook, Airbnb, they're all trying to combat a range of different things on their platform, from human trafficking to terrorism, criminal networks, bullying, a whole host of different things. So let's say if you're trying to unpick, let's say, or look at criminal networks in online spaces, and the way you frame the question defaults to thinking about the people who, let's say, from a stereotypical perspective, might be committing those crimes, and you think about that from a demographic lens, or from a perspective of skin tone, or one's beard style, you're going to take your potential understanding from out here to here, or even way over there, and you're gonna answer the wrong thing. Because as behavioral science tells us, things like skin tone or one's beard trim are not predictors of criminal activity. Right? It's psychological motivators that are predictors of these sorts of things. So when we can understand that and we have that relevance as to how we're framing the question, that's ultimately when we can be effective. The third core tenet of beneficial intelligence is methodological agnosticism. Now within the technology space, there's a lot of talk about large language models, big data sets, quantum, computational power, bigger, better, more scale, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all well and good. It's very powerful. It also can create a blunt, bit of a blunt instrument in certain contexts. So within beneficial intelligence, and especially with that emphasis on relevance, we like to think of data as a very refined, precise Japanese sword, where we get very precise and very fine-tuned about the insights that we're generating. And in that sort of context, let's say primary research or even a small language model has as much of a place as a large language model does. What matters most is what's relevant to answering the question we're trying to understand and what kind of data and what kind of methodology is most representative of who we're trying to understand. And that's really what matters in the end. The fourth core component of beneficial intelligence is human augmentation. So while AGI, as I mentioned, has a stated objective of AI outperforming the human, Beneficial intelligence has a stated objective of empowering the human and empowering the human with the right data to ask smarter questions and derive better strategies that ultimately drive a positive societal impact. The fifth core component of beneficial intelligence, and I have to say probably the toughest one, is judiciousness and being able to weigh multiple perspectives in your head at the same time that perhaps feel conflicting. Why this is so challenging is it forces us to overcome our own cognitive barriers and biases towards how we frame certain communities. And I'll give you an example. If, let's say, you're on the political left and you're tasked with trying to figure out how do you build a bridge with somebody on the political right and you default to thinking about said community on the political right as backwards, uneducated, fascist, insert whatever choice of label you want onto that community, you've completely negated your ability to conduct beneficial intelligence and to build a bridge because you've been overcome by your own biases. And while it can be incredibly uncomfortable and confrontational to see data 
that actually uh, uh, sort of contradicts our perspective, it's essential. It's the only way we actually arrive at a, a compromise and a place of peace at the end of the day, is to humanize people and to see them for what they are and to let data actually power that. But we have to want to see that. And that's where this core tenet is so critical. And the last core component of beneficial intelligence is impact. And this is really where beneficial intelligence begins. Because when we can envision success and we know exactly what we want to achieve and we can work backwards, that's when we can actually drive at success. So think about that impact orientation as the spine of beneficial intelligence and all of the previous tenants or core vertebrae. And what this impact orientation helps us do is ask the question in a much more effective way. It enables us to think about what is it we're trying to drive at, potential second and third degree effects, and to measure that over time so that way we get even sharper and sharper at how we drive impact. And that ultimately leads us to a place where we can fire one arrow and hit the bullseye as opposed to firing 20 and sort of kind of getting close to it. But precision, precision is the key and impact is the key. And we need this now. We need this now more than ever. And what we're talking about is not necessarily a revolution of technology. We're not talking about building new technology necessarily. What we're talking about is a movement. What we're talking about is humanism. That's what's most revolutionary about this. And what that takes then is iconoclastic humanistic thinkers that are willing to challenge the status quo, who don't necessarily subscribe to the belief that what is ought to be, but also don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that we're headed for a dystopian reality where robots enslave all of humanity and take over all of our jobs. That's not what we're talking about here. But what that requires more than anything else is courage. Because fundamentally, we're talking about stepping out onto the minefield of the most contentious polarizing issues of our time where we see people getting canceled constantly. And that is daunting and that's terrifying but we have to have the courage to try because that's the only way things evolve. So I'd like to leave you with a final thought. So when you wake up tomorrow morning and you have a coffee and you open your phone and you scroll through the news, have a think about what story kind of hits you, what sticks with you, what kind of hits you in the feels and think about why. What is it about that story that speaks to you? It could be something you personally identify with. It could be a story related to poverty, the upcoming election, everything happening in the Middle East right now. But think about what is that story that sticks with you? And then what happens when you apply beneficial intelligence to the end state you would hope to see for that situation? Just in that exercise alone, you are stepping into the solution. And that's ultimately what moves mountains. So I'm gonna ask us to do something a little bit radical here. And I'd like us to commit to something, which is let's commit to stepping into the solution. Let's commit to staying part of the solution, even when it feels daunting and exhausting and terrifying and depressing. And most of all, let's commit to staying into being more human. Thank you. <laughs>